Okay, so welcome to uh, my lecture today, which is in the field of computer engineering. And before I start, I should tell you that I, I have a little bit of a cold. So if you uh, don't hear me very well, or if I'm not clear, just let me know. I may also need to sit down after a while, but hopefully we'll be okay. Um, I want to also uh, just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, why I'm here, why I'm speaking English, for example, and what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 45 minutes. My name is Amy Lutfi. Uh, I come from Canada. And like many teachers here at the university, I don't only teach, I do uh, research. And I have a background in engineering. So I ha I'm a, an electrical engineer, uh, a civil engineer, as you say in Swedish, in electrical engineering. And I'm working at the Department of Science and Technology, which is a fairly large department at this university. And I'm also part of a research group uh, called the Center for Applied Autonomous Sensor Systems. And it's a, it's a very long word that basically means that we work a lot with sensors, robots, and intelligent systems. And my lecture today is going to tell you a little bit about what these are. Um, I actually came to Sweden to do research, so I, I first came as an exchange student, and this is something many of our students have a chance to do uh, during their bachelor degree, is to go away for six months or a year. And I came to Sweden from Canada for six months, and during that period I actually had uh, a few teachers that I thought were very inspiring, who taught me a lot about some of the things I'm going to teach you about today. And that motivated me to come back and do uh, a PhD. And then I was stuck here ever since. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to give you this lecture today. And I hope that I can inspire you and give you an idea of, of what are the topics we talk about, not only in our computer engineering programs, but also in the other types of programs that we have uh, at, at Technique. And the lecture I'll give you today is very introductory. Uh, it is about robotics and intelligent systems. You can consider it sort of the first lecture that you would either have in a course about robotics and intelligent systems, or a lecture that you would have in a course about artificial intelligence. And we have such courses already in the second year of our computer engineering program. Now, just a little bit more about where I work, uh, because as I mentioned, I teach, but I also do quite a bit of research. I'm part of a research group where there are about 50 people uh, in our research group, and we, we do a lot of different types of projects on robots, where our goal is to try and get robots to work in what we call very uh, unstructured and dynamic environments. So we try and get robots to work either outside or in a home, in places where you don't normally see robots working too often. And these are really challenging problems, but they're a lot of fun. And we work a lot with Swedish industry. So we work a lot, for example, with Atlas Copco, Volvo Trucks, Linda Trucks. And these companies, together with us, try and find solutions to what they consider to be future problems. Okay? So, let's start with just a basic introduction to robotics. The word robot, I think, is really exciting because when you hear the ro word robot, many people think of very many different things. Um, and a lot of our, our inspiration comes from several influences, like literature, movies, but also what we see in industry today. Now, many people maybe wonder where the word robot comes from, and the actual origin of the word robot is, is a Czech word, and it comes from a play called Rossum's Universal Robots, and it basically was coined, it means that the word was used the first time in the 1920s, to refer to somebody, or in this case, something that was just constantly doing work, a manual laborer, a serf, or a slave. Now this is very interesting because this is very far, perhaps, from how we use the word robot today. And depending on who you ask, you actually will get a variety of different definitions of what a robot is. 
So for example, if you're talking to somebody from industry and you ask them, what do you think a robot is, you tend to get an image that looks like this. If I ask maybe many of you, or I ask many people who've seen a lot of films, then you usually get an image of a robot that looks like this. And this is very interesting because there are fundamental differences between those two types of machines. And let me just try and explain what some of those differences are. So for example, if we take this type of, of robot, it has a certain set of properties, a certain set of features. It's very functional, which means it's usually made to do one thing. Um, it tends to have a very fixed program, which means it can only do that one thing and can't do anything else. Typical example of that kind of machine is, is something in a factory that's maybe one arm is supposed to mount the windshield onto one car. And that's all it does over and over again. And it usually is, as a result, very accurate and very efficient. So it can put that windshield in over and over again and do it with millimeter precision, which is very good. But it means that it also doesn't have so much sensing on it. And I'll explain in a little bit what the sensing does. But it doesn't have so many extra features on it that allows it to be adaptive. So whether it's picking up a windshield or whether it's picking up a rock or whether it's picking up someone's head, it doesn't matter. It will still pick it up and put it in place. Now if we look at the opposite, or not really the opposite, but let's say another variant of a robot or another variant of a machine, this type of machine is very different in the sense that it's not functional in the sense that it only does one thing. It usually tends to be multi-purpose. You usually want this kind of robot to do many different things for you. It should lift things, it carry them, it should go from one place to another and so on. Some of these machines are very biologically inspired. It kind of looks like a human being, at least in the way it's been designed. They're adaptive. They should learn. They have extensive sensing abilities. It should be able to hear. It should be able to touch. It should be able to feel the pressure under its feet. Uh, it should be able to see. And perhaps one of the hardest things is that it should also be communicative. This machine is made to talk to us. And it does it either perhaps by speech or by motion, by giving gestures. It's the communication that makes this a much more developed machine. And it's interesting because when we're talking about robots and intelligent systems in this course, or in other courses, it tends to be this kind of machine that we focus on. And there's several reasons why. What's fascinating that we see now in industry is that we're going more and more from this kind of machine into this kind of machine. So we have our factories that can build cars and they do it very well. This is what we call automation. But we're also seeing a new kinds of industry emerge where we want to see much more adaptive machines. For example, lawn mowing is one example where we're seeing a lot of robot lawn mowers and they should be more adaptive. They shouldn't Cut, the, cut no matter what, they should cut the grass and all of our lawns look slightly different than each other's. Same thing with the vacuum cleaner robots. But also in other factories, they're trying to get machines to be more adaptable, working closer together with humans. So this, this uh, movement in robotics is going from this type of machine to this one. And how do we do that? How do we bring a machine like this to a machine like this? Well. One of them is adding sensors. Now what do sensors do? Well, sensors allow us to understand the world around us. Let's, let's look at ourselves, because humans are a very good inspiration when we're trying to make robots. When we need to perceive what's going around us, we use our eyes, we use our ears, a sense of smell, taste, touch. We also have other senses. We sense, for example, how our organs are doing inside our body, the sense of pain. And these help us to behave in the world. I know where I should go because I see where I should go. And the hard thing for robotics, to make a robot really adaptable, to make a robot go from being in a, in a cage to basically going and being into our living rooms and vacuum cleaning, is that it needs to also have sensors. What kind of sensors can a robot have? Well, a robot can, for example, have touch. And we've seen that. 
If a robot bumps into something, we have a bumper, and that bumper gets depressed, and then it knows that it's bumped into something, and then uh, it will stop moving. So that's one possibility. The other thing that a robot can have is vision, camera. And we know that we've gotten quite far with vision today. For example, if you take a picture with your phone, you now have face recognition. It can find the faces inside the picture. So we can start to understand what's inside pictures. So all of these sensors are really important. The other thing that we're starting to do is we're starting to get devices to cooperate. Um, this means that Robots don't have to be able to do everything all by themselves. A very good example of this is GPS. So a robot maybe doesn't have to figure out where it is, but it can talk to a satellite and get information and know where its exact position is. So you can get cooperating devices. We have lots of services that we can use. The robot can go on the internet and ask for information if needed. And then the other thing that we're starting to do is look more and more at communication. This is probably one of the hardest tasks in the field of robotics, as to how to get robots to communicate in a good way. But we're learning how to communicate. Now we have good speech recognition. You've seen this on your smartphones as well. But uh, there are other ways that you can do communication, as I mentioned before, gestures and so on. Now. <clears throat> to make a robot really go from being that simple, silly arm to being something much more complex, it needs to be able to do a couple of, of things. So sensing and perceiving is one of them. Communication, I mentioned, is another one. But also, we would like robots to be able to learn. This is really interesting. Imagine if the robot would navigate into your living room trying to vacuum clean and eventually it would understand, okay, this is where the sofa is. I don't need to bump into it every single time. Or maybe even a robot can reason about things. So for example, if it sees something and it looks like a cup, but it's hanging upside down from the ceiling, maybe it would reason, well, it can't be a cup because cups don't hang upside down. Maybe it's a lampshade instead. So to be able to reason like you and I reason. And all of these skills and attributes, they have a word. We categorize them as something. And they're simply called artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is the key. AI is the key to making robots work in a very dynamic environment. With AI, we can do so much. And we actually have achieved a lot with AI already today. And I'm going to show you some examples how. And the thing is, is that we can put AI onto a very complicated machine like this, but we can also put it on different types of machines. Some machines that look like us, some machines that don't look like us at all. And I'm going to just show you a video here uh, that gives you an example of how AI can work on different types of robots. So this is a video from a uh, competition called uh, RoboCup. Now, nobody is remote controlling these robots. They're playing soccer. There are two teams playing. So you have one team here and one team here, and they're playing against each other. And think about what they need to do to be able to achieve some of these tasks. First of all, they need to figure out where the ball is. That's quite hard, and they have sensors on them where they can see the ball. And then they have to be able to adjust their body so they can actually kick the ball or pass the ball. Then they have to understand where their teammates are. So they have to figure out who's on their team and who's not on their team so that they could pass to each other and actually make a strategy because ultimately the goal is to score a goal. So this is one thing that needs to work. And then they also have to understand where the opposing team is. This is football, you know? It's just a simple game of football, but it's such a complex <laughs> task to play football because there are so many high-level processes that are required. And so getting robots to be able to play football is a really interesting case for us researchers because it means putting together all of the things 
that we humans are actually naturally very good at. And this is more or less where AI was in 2006. So you can imagine how much further we've come today. So let's get a bit technical here. So what is artificial intelligence? Well, <clears throat> there are a couple of definitions and I'll take you through some of them. So AI, um, well first let's start with artificial. So artificial, simply not natural or real typically made by us. Intelligence is the power of perceiving, learning, understanding, and knowing. Notice that these were the key words, particularly the perceiving, learning, which I talked to you about before, how we can get machines to learn and so on. Some definitions. Artificial intelligence is the design the stu and study of computer programs that behave intelligently. It doesn't maybe give us so much more information. AI is the branch of computer science that is concerned with the automation of intelligent behavior. So how you get something to be intelligent and to run intelligently by itself. AI is the art of making computers work the way they do in the movies. I don't know if this is the, the wisest of definitions, but it's some definitions out there about AI. In fact, there is no common consensus about how we define AI, but there is at least at the university level, some core topics that we teach you in the field of artificial intelligence. Now typically, as a researcher and working within the field of AI, we say there are two types of AIs. There's what we call weak AI, and weak AI is basically the illusion of AI. So it's basically making a machine seem as if it's intelligent, but it, it isn't really. I think you might have encountered such examples, for example, uh, when you're browsing. IKEA has one. You can ask a question. You know, you go into the corner of the screen and there's some kind of bot that will uh, accept a question. It can usually accept a question in any format. What it does is it looks at the keywords in the question and then sees if it has anything in the search results that match those keywords. And if you write something silly like, please go away, I don't like you, you'll get some random response back, like, thank you very much, have a nice day. So it's not a smart intelligence. It's what we call a weak intelligence. It's the appearance of it. But then there is strong AI. Uh, and strong AI is really having um, the full intelligence, and even to the point where machines almost seem to have a real conscious mind. We don't have strong AI today. It doesn't exist. We have something in between, but much closer to the weak AI. And I think to some extent our goal is to reach here, but not always. And I'll explain a little bit more what that means. And strong AI we've seen examples of in, in different movies. So if we can uh, make AI, and make machines that are capable of artificial intelligent thinking, how do, we, how do we know it? How do we test for AI? This is something that researchers have been thinking about for quite some time. And there's different ways to do it. One of them is something called the Turing test. Alan Turing was one of the, uh, let's say, pioneers in the field of artificial intelligence. And maybe some of you have already heard of, of Turing before. And he made up this test that was quite simple, really. He said that if you separate, let's say, uh, two people by a, by a room, so they don't see each other, and I'm in one room and I'm typing questions like, hello, how are you? And on my screen I get answers. And in the other room, there's either a person answering or a computer answering. So let's say I'm in my room, I say, hi, how are you doing? And I see on my screen, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? And I'm having a dialogue. And you ask me, do, I, do you think I'm talking to a machine or to another person? And I say, oh, well, based on these responses, I must be talking to another person. But actually, the truth is I was talking to a machine. Then according to Turing, that machine is intelligent. So it's a weak AI, you see? So he thinks that if you can fool a human being into thinking it's interacting with another human, then the machine is intelligent. 
A lot of people don't agree with Turing on this. In fact, I don't agree with Turing on this because, in fact, the test for intelligence should be more than that. But this is what the literature is saying. And in fact, if any of you are interested, there is a very big contest every year called the Lobner Prize where you make a Turing machine. So there are students who make a Turing machine, a machine that can answer these kind of questions, what we call chatbots. And if you're able to fool the judges that it's actually a person, then you can win this, this prize, which is a large sum of money. So that's one way in which we can test for intelligence, but in my opinion, it's still not an adequate way to test for intelligence. Now, why did I put these pictures up? Well, because after this discussion of how do we test for intelligence, there were two researchers, Russell and Norvig, who are big guys in the field of AI, who said, forget the Turing test. The Turing test, it's, it's not important. Actually, if we would do the Turing test and apply it to another field, let's take the Turing test and apply it, for example, to the field of aviation. What would that mean? Well, it would basically mean that our objective is not to just make flying machines, but to make flying machines that could fool all the birds in the sky that it was also a bird. <laughs> and if you really think about it, that's irrelevant. Actually, what is important is that we make flying machines that have a purpose in our society, that can actually do something that no other biological counterpart, there's no example in nature that can do the same thing as an airplane can do today. And whether or not the birds think it's a bird, it's irrelevant. And in fact, this is the engineering view of AI. And this is a view of AI which I subscribe to in the sense that I think this is the most important view of AI. And this is when the field of artificial intelligence stopped becoming something that was a philosophical field where people started to think, what is intelligence? and started to become an engineering field when we started to ask ourselves, can we make intelligent programs that can help our lives, that can in improve our life? And actually the answer is yes, because in the past 10, 15, and even 20 years, we have a huge amount of AI around us, although we may not recognize it as being there. Google is a perfect example of AI. Here you're using a search engine, and search engines are a very, very powerful AI tool. If you've ever bought a book from Amazon and there are recommendations, that's also an example of AI. It is an example of learning, of how a machine is able to learn your preferences over time based on examples. If you are trying to go from one point to another point. If you're navigating, anybody who uses GPS is also using AI because the planning system which tries to optimize how you can drive from Örebro to Stockholm, given that there's traffic and maybe you have to replan, is an AI system. And certainly, if you're playing any type of computer game, especially a game like chess, you're using AI. So there are examples of AI around us all the time. So here's a, an example that I'm going to work with you, um, just to explain to you a little bit how AI works. Because I told you about computer games, I told you about uh, GPS and how it works, but the question is, I mean, how do you actually get a computer to use a little bit of AI? And the answer really lies in what we call representation. So you have to bear with me for a little bit, but we know that computers are good at doing one thing, and that is computing. They're very, very good at numbers. In fact, they're not so good with symbols yet, but computers are very good at manipulating numbers and doing calculations really quickly. So if we could take any problem and represent it numerically, so represent problems by using numbers, then we would be able to get our computer to deal with the problem. Now some problems are easier to represent numerically than others. If I have two apples and I get two more apples, 
That's an easy problem to represent numerically, right? But what about this problem here? Let's say I have a robot, and I want the robot to vacuum my room, to vacuum my living room. And I don't only want it to vacuum the living room, I want it to vacuum the entire living room. I want to make sure all of it is covered. And I want, when it's done, I want the robot to go back to its charging station and I want it to switch off. That's my problem. Now, I have to make a computer program do that, right? So the key here is how do I represent this problem to a machine? How do I code it for a computer so that it would be able to solve this problem? And I'm going to show you how. It's actually not that complicated. So, now you take that picture there, uh, and I'll just redraw it here. Let's say this is my living room. This is my robot, and we can put an obstacle here, okay? Now, if I want to represent this problem numerically, I have to translate this into something that my computer can understand. And for this exercise, what I'll do is I'll make it into basically uh, a grid. I'll chop up my living room into small little sections, okay? So now I have these, these grids, each, each, each cell, basically, is an area of my, of my living room. And I'll say that this, this cell, I'll, I'll give it a, a location. Let's say it's location zero, zero. This is the starting point, okay? And I will say that I'll put inside each cell a number. If I am at my starting point, I'll put the number one. So let me just represent that over here. So that number one is actually in here, okay? And if I haven't been anywhere, I'll put the number zero. So I put zeros here like this, and I'll just draw it here. So I have one, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four, five, six. So one. Okay, and so on. So now basically I've just chopped up my living room and I've put numbers in each spot. And I've marked my starting point, which is actually where my robot is, as being number one. Okay, then I will let my robot uh, wander. I'll let it move. And as my robot moves, it's kind of like you remember the story of Hansel and Gretel. As they went through the forest, they left a breadcrumb beside, behind them. Well, I'll let my robot do the same thing. So as my robot takes a step forward, it will basically leave a number behind it. We already have used number one. So as it takes a step forward, it will leave the number two. And as it takes another step, it will leave a number three and take another step, leave the number four. So I'll let my robot move around here. So let's say the robot goes from this position here, it goes here, here, here. So the robot has moved from one, and then it leaves a bit of a trail behind it, two, three, four. Okay? So the robot is moving and leaving a trail behind it. Now let's say the robot tries to go here, and here I have my sofa. So the robot tries to go down to the sofa, but it receives a bump. Good thing it has sensors, right? So it gets its bump. And when it receives a bump, we make a rule and we say, okay, every time you get a bump, why don't you again leave a number, but instead of leaving an incremental number, why don't you leave a really high number that indicates a bump? So if, if it got a bump when it tries to go down to the sofa, let's say you leave the number 1,000, okay? And we know the sofa is still here. Actually, the sofa covers about two, two grid marks, so we can leave 1,000s here. 
So this indicates where my, where my sofa is on my map. All right? And then maybe the robot would wander a bit more. Let's say it goes, it bumped here, it didn't work. So maybe the robot will go to this position here. So it leaves a five behind it there, and a six, and a seven. First of all, before I go any further, when you see this structure of numbers, can anyone tell me what this is? If I do this, do you see what it is? There's a word for it. What is this called? Mathematically. It starts with the letter M. And there was a nice movie about it. Someone said it. Say it louder. Matrix. Very good. This is a matrix, right? It's, and this matrix is simply a representation of my living room with the location of the robot inside. How is it a representation of my living room? Well, I have a thousand where I have furniture, and I have a trail where my robot has been. Okay, so I have this nice matrix. By the way, if you ever wonder why the movie is called Matrix, this is the reason why. This matrix is the representation of the real world, mathematically. So if I go back to my problem and I say the robot has to clean the entire room, well, if I've managed to represent my world as a matrix, how can I make the robot clean the entire room? The answer is simple. I make a rule and I say I want to make the robot go everywhere so that there are no more zeros in my matrix. And if I find a zero, so if I know there's still a zero, I send the robot to that position. Okay? So that way I can explore the entire matrix. Now the next question, how do I send the robot home <coughs> after? Well, the key, the answer to sending the robot home is in the trail. Because what I do is I make another rule that simply says, robot, always go to the lowest number. So you can imagine, after the robot's been running around, leaving its trail of breadcrumbs behind it, it will have, for example, the number 8 here, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Let's say the robot is here. It's just performed sort of this, this route. The robot is, is here, which would be somewhere about here in my, in my living room. Now the robot has no more zeros. Get rid of that one. Can put this one as a, an obstacle just for the sake of the example. Now the robot has no more zeros to go to. It means it's explored the entire living room. Now it's time for the robot to go home. We say, robot, always go to the lowest number. So the robot will say, okay, I've been here. Here's a 13 around me. What's lower? Oh, well, I have a 12. So it will start going back. And then it will go 11, 10, 9. The robot will be here. It'll have to always go to the lowest number. What is the lowest number in my matrix? This is my lowest number, which is home. This is a bit of a complicated example to digest all at once. You can think about it when you go home. The point that I want to make with this example is that if we're able to represent a problem, a problem as complex as vacuuming the living room, which I guess many of us have never done, a problem as complex as that, if we're able to represent it by numbers, the computer will solve it like that. And the key for AI is representation. And that is how computer games play chess. And that is how we plan routes from Örebro to Stockholm. And that is how we do all of these things because we're able to transform problems into something numerical and make it into a computer program that's solvable. 
And that's how AI works. It's not magical. It's just a completely different new representation. Any questions? Crystal clear, right? Good. All right, so I'll just spend the next 10 minutes shifting gears because now I've talked to you about you know, robotics. I've talked to you about artificial intelligence. I've told you a bit how you can make programs, but I shouldn't forget perhaps the most important part, which is the ethical dimensions of what we do. Roboethics. So if we are going from an industrial revolution where we have a lot of machines to making machines smarter, to giving them maybe a little bit of AI so that they can make decisions by themselves. This obviously will have huge implications about how machines coexist with us. Which means we as engineers have to have a little bit of insight into what is allowed and what is not allowed. Now the interesting thing is, is that if we want to think about making machines from an ethical point of view, so we don't make machines that do whatever, we have to sort of ask ourselves, what do intelligent machines actually mean? You know, what is, what is an intelligent machine? And really there are four, four schools of thought in this. First is that no matter how much AI you put into a machine, it's always a machine. So people just do not believe that you can actually make machines intelligent in the same way we are intelligent. That's one school of thought. The other one is, well, they do have somewhat of an ethical dimension. There's another school of thought, and this one is quite frightening, actually, and this is that you can actually make machines have their own sense of morals. I'll explain this a bit later. And then there's also a fourth one, which is equally frightening, which is about the fact that people believe, there are some people who believe, that we are sort of creating a new species by making machines intelligent. So there's some people who are very frightened by the fact of putting robots and AI together. But the point is, is that when we talk about robo-ethics, really, fundamentally, it boils down to human ethics. So robo-ethics is not any different than the same ethics that regulate people who do, for example, genetic testing. It is the ethics that applies to us as humans who are designing robots. And what is very interesting is that when we start talking about robo-ethics, we see that we cannot escape the cultural debate. Different people with, from different cultural backgrounds have different opinions about how ethics should evolve with robotics. Um, just to give you some examples. So Western culture, especially European, North American culture, we tend to look at machines only as machines. We like to see our machines as being tools. And we are very, very concerned that machines will do something bad. Uh, and this you see in our pop culture and our media. It actually comes from our literature from a long time ago. We've been talking about having uh, autonomous machines for a long time. Frankenstein is an example. Gollum is another example. Um, this is not the Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but there's another Gollum, which is about a, an autonomous machine. And in fact, all of these examples in our literature about machines show our robots somehow taking over and for some reason attacking us. What's interesting is that if we go to the other side, let's say if we go to Asia, particularly if we go to Japan, they have a completely different view. And in fact, most of their machines are viewed as victims of our, let's say, human cruelty as opposed to the other way around. So usually their machines are much more innocent. And as a result, we see that when it comes to regulating how we develop machines, we have different attitudes. Historically, we have different attitudes about what's, what's allowed. And I'm going to show you two, two case studies. Uh, one of them is basically showing you the fact that uh, robots are nothing else but machines. This was a, an incident that happened here in Sweden. And the other example is showing you that there is an ethical dimension uh, to uh, robots. 
Both of them are related, let's say, to real cases, and one of them is more on robots being used in industry, and the other one is robots in uh, science and technology. <coughs> so let's take the Swedish case that happened. Um, so not very long ago, uh, just outside of Bolsta, there was a, um, a mobile arm that was working in a factory, and the task of the arm was to pick up, basically go down, pick up a, a, a rock, a, a, a concrete block, move it, and, and drop it. So it just did that repeatedly. And it was in a cage. And one day, the, an employee who believed the machine was switched off, walked into the cage, and the machine was not switched off, and the machine turned on, because it was triggered by his movement, went down, picked him up by his head, lifted him up, and dropped him. It didn't know, you know, it, it, it thought it was a, a, a concrete block. Now, what was interesting was, all of a sudden, uh, a huge uh, media storm was raised, because the question was, how could a robot, which they had assumed was intelligent enough to know the difference. It, how could it her, harm a, a person? And the headlines were very interesting. For example, robot abuses employee. Like you would never see something like this. If someone fell off their ladder, you would never say a ladder has abused someone. But in this case, the robot has abused an employee because the robot is perceived as having a certain amount of intelligence. Now the question was, Who's to blame? Ethically, whose fault is it? Is it the fault of the guy who walked into the cage? Is it the fault of the boss who didn't protect his employees well enough? Is it the fault of the engineer who built the robot? How many of you think it's the fault of the guy? Raise your hand. And the fault of the boss? And the fault of the engineer? Most of you attribute to the guy. Actually, it's the boss. So it is the employer who was found to be mostly at fault, with some of the fault on the guy, but actually he was able to get some compensation for, for the fact that they had this accident, simply because the safety rules were deemed not adequate enough. But what is interesting, again, as I said, was that this all of a sudden awoke a debate and that is that if machines can make decisions by themselves, who will be responsible for these machines? In Sweden, it's the person who buys the machine. But we'll see what happens when we have other cases, for example, with lawn mowers, vacuum cleaners, and so on. So the ethical debate is an important one. Here's another example. This was an example which actually I, I witnessed myself at a conference. Um, what they had done, <coughs> and this is an example of researchers perhaps not behaving in the best way, uh, they had made a little robot out of this doll here. And what they did is they were showing um, the children the, the robot doll, and the doll was, was actually being remote controlled. That's why I have the picture of Wizard of Oz here. So the doll was being remote controlled, and the children were interacting with the doll, thinking that it was a real robot completely autonomous. And then the researcher said, this, this robot has been very bad, so we're going to take it and we're going to put it into a closet. And so they pick up the robot and they put it into the closet and you hear the robot saying, no, no, let me out, let me out. And they, they treat the robot very badly and they want to see what happens to the children. And some of the children become very upset. Of course, because they believe the robot actually has real feelings. And then they see the robot being mistreated, and they get very upset. And the researchers think, oh, well, well this is good, you know? We, we get some response from the children. Obviously, they like the robot. <coughs> Interesting experiment. But ethically, this is actually quite questionable. Because they're creating an illusion about the machine, and they are affecting they're affecting people, in this case, small children, into thinking that 
the machine is really being mistreated because it has a certain level of intelligence. And this is something that you guys should keep an eye out for, particularly when you hear more and more about robots and elderly, for example. What happens when somebody with severe dementia believes that the robot they're holding, this robot seal, is a real pet and the battery dies? And the emotions they will go through. Is it ethically incorrect or ethically correct? Does the benefit of having that robot to comfort them outweigh the negative disadvantage of fooling them? So these are all really interesting questions that you study when you study uh, roboethics. So I'm just going to summarize now. Uh, my intention was to give you sort of a, a taste of some of the key topics in robotics. You saw that maybe robotics is a very complex field. It involves a lot of different things. And I try to focus on the fact that AI is a very important component. And I also talked to you a little bit about the philosophy about AI. But we are inspired by also many other different areas. For example, art, um, uh, neuroscience, linguistics, these are all coming into the field of robotics. So it's a very multidisciplinary field. Some people just see it as a purely technical one, but it's not. In fact, we pull a lot of inspiration from a lot of different things. And today I've tried to show you some examples of robots. I showed you very lightly how we do AI, and you can study AI for uh, many years. So it's a quite a, uh, an in-depth field. And I've also tried to explain to you the importance of thinking ethically when we look at AI and robotics. So thank you very much. And I'm open to questions if you have them. <coughs>